Monk Rowe, and I'm very pleased to have saxophonist and composer Javon Jackson with me today for Thank the Jazz you. Archive. Good to be with you. Thank you. Looking forward to your concert here, and uh, but I wanted to start off asking you a little bit about something that I, I'm guessing is important to you, and that is your, compos your composing. I'm uh, getting more uh, involved with composing. Uh, very much involved with it now as the years have gone on. Mm -hmm. uh, joining R. Blakey, that was something that he um, really uh, emphasized for us to do writing. And it's very important um, to find your own self uh, and some sense of your individuality through your writing. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. I saw a recent addition to your website in the going to do a film score for something in Syracuse. Right, in about three weeks. Very excited about it. Um, got an opportunity to write a score for a uh, Hitchcock silent film called The Lodger. So finished it up in the summer and finally got all the parts ready and sending them out to the musicians. And so we have a rehearsal the day before the premiere and then we do play the music live in front of an audience How with cool. the film above us. So I'm pretty psyched to get connected um, to Hitchcock in this fashion. <laughs> How do you go about landing a commission like that or whatever you want to call it? Well, I met the uh, artistic director's wife, um, told her of my interest in, in, and uh, my uh, willingness to be a part of writing for film or TV. It's been something that I've uh, kind of been looking for and so got a chance to speak to her husband and um, they asked me if I'd like to do it, and I jumped at it. <laughs> so got started in basically February. So uh, it's been a great process, a um, learning process for me. Traveling and doing it has been unique as well because um, I've been writing basically from the piano to sheet music, which nowadays everything's done through <laughs> a program. So I'm actually archaic at this point, but I'll get up to speed with the various uh, programs yeah. that are available to me on the next project. So I had some help in terms of getting it put into a, a program and then obviously right. needed help to sync the music up with the film. Ah, I know right where you're at with that. It's okay. about <laughs> trying to learn finale and that kind of stuff. Right. Did, did you have, um, not restrictions, but did they have to tell you, well, here's our budget, here's what we can do as far as musicians and so forth. Absolutely. The budget was, um, you know, light, <laughs> but it's their budget that they have every year and obviously with all of the other various um, events that they have going on, I was happy to take it and the other musicians have been willing to, to work with me and uh, for me, I would have almost paid a little bit just to do it. So sure. um, the opportunity speaks volumes to um, my chance at something like this. So it's, um, like I said, a learn, good learning process uh, for me to go through and then also uh, something to have a little cachet to, to show the people about my ability in this area. Right. How is it different from that kind of specific assignment, something that's going to go with a visual, as opposed to you're sitting and at the piano and you want to write something for your band? Well, with my band, uh, with the situation with a uh, jazz group, um, the performance obviously is going to be much more um, uh, in the moment or more uh, extemporaneous in terms of the presentation, whereas the, the skeleton, which is the melody, is a small piece at the beginning for the most part and a small piece at the beginning at the end which mirror each other, whereas in the music, in a film, especially with a silent film, music is continuous. So we have a general theme, and then hopefully you can di um, develop that theme in different ways, maybe in a different key or in a different uh, tempo, um, different meter is what I mean, uh, all these different colors, or maybe uh, one instrument plays the melody, and later on the melody is played by another instrument. So the melodies are kind of more blown out and flushed out as opposed to uh, in a situation with a small group, I play the melody and then we probably light off into soloing. So um, also the melody takes its own life along with that individual that you are linked the character to. 
so that that character begins to uh, shape the melody by their behavior in the film, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. Right. Is, will this music for this film be improvised at all? There is improvisation, okay. but a lot of it is uh, just pretty much through composed and just Scored, um, yeah. written parts. Uh, it's not as much improvisation as I think one would expect from me. It's yeah. actually more written and with melodies and supporting the themes and supporting the um, individuals and the direction in which the story goes. So trying to allow that to be my um, blueprint. Yeah, whenever I try to write something that doesn't have much improvisation in it, I get discouraged. I write and write, and then I time it, and I got, oh, I have 90 seconds so far. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I just looked at the scenes. Um, uh -huh. If the scene um, was a certain amount of minutes, it didn't matter because I had to have the music to fit the scene mm -hmm. as if... Um, that was my framework. So when the scene or when something shifted, then uh, the music in my mind would shift with the story. So let's talk about our Blakey and composing. I'm, I'm thinking of um, you taking a tune to Mr. Blakey and why would he like something and not something else? Well, one thing that was unique about Art Blakey, he didn't um, dislike anything. He would take any individual's music and make it work for the ensemble. He might have a suggestion, or he might have um, some uh, constructive criticism, but by and large, I never saw Art just dismiss a song. Uh, he would find a way to rehearse it. We'd play it a couple times now. If he liked it, it would get played more maybe than someone else's compositions, but I never knew Art, because he really encouraged everyone to write music. So in that respect, Art was very supportive, because he knew we were, for the most part, most of us were just embryonic with the writing aspect, being young guys. And some of the older musicians, when I mean older, maybe 23, 24, they had a little bit more experience with writing, or who just had a better ability, then maybe more of their songs would be played. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone that came in the band wasn't Benny Golson or wasn't... Um, in, in my time, a Donald Brown or a Mulgrew Miller who wrote really strong compositions, but uh, he found a way to incorporate the music in the Messenger uh, songbook at some point, or Wayne Short, I mean, some of these other special artists, but art really was encouraging. He, and that's something I think sometimes we all uh, talk about in jazz messengers, but we all know it's understated that art was very, very supportive of young musicians. I mean, he made it his whole life's work to support young musicians as they came up and as they developed and then they left and he got more young musicians and developed them and the cycle just continued for, let's say, mid-50s until he passed. So he really did a whole lot in terms of nurturing or creating a foundation for this, this art form. Do you know if a lot of those fellows who started out with him or did that training, did most of them leave to become leaders themselves? Or did he, did he tell them, look, time for you to move on? Well, each situation would be different. I think some musicians felt that it was time to leave. I think in some situations he knew when to get an, another musician out of the nest to say. So every situation was different. Mm -hmm. But we all feel that having, at least I can speak for the musicians that I knew, the Freddie Hubbards of the world or the, um, the Jackie McLeans or um, uh, various other artists, that once they left art, there was a certain learning um, curve that you go through that you did feel um, a certain comfort level with how to lead bands or you had some experience because you got to watch someone in action. And there's so many things that I, more and more as I become an experienced band leader, I look back to him and say, okay, now some of the things that he did make sense where they didn't make sense before, or as a young person as a uh, coming up, you didn't necessarily agree with it, but as the leader, somebody has to make the decision. And um, as President Obama was finding out, people, no matter what the decision is, there's always going to be someone who doesn't agree with it, 
and there's going to be someone who can work with it. And But being a leader, you have to uh, delegate and not worry about how people feel about you as, a, as, a, as, a, as more so just to be respected for what you're trying to do and hopefully that's appreciated. Can you give me a specific example of something that he might have done for taking care of business on the bandstand, for instance? On the bandstand, it wasn't so authoritative as opposed to uh, maybe some general situations, I mean, travel decisions had to be made. On the bandstand, Art was supportive. Now, for example, if um, there was something that he didn't like, he wouldn't tell you what to do, but he would say, leave that aspect out. Uh, for example, one time uh, I uh, was in a part of the show where they called Feature Time, where he would let an artist come down front and play uh, a ballad feature with the rhythm section. So I'm the saxophonist, piano, bass, and art, and I play a ballad. So just joining, um, sometimes we're working on these figures or working on lines on our own mm -hmm. for phrases. And uh, I had a bit of a habit um, with playing a phrase, maybe the phrase didn't come out like I wanted, maybe going back and try to play the phrase, okay? And uh, a couple times, I think maybe I was doing it in a way that it was noticeable to the audience. So he just said, listen, if you make a mistake, make it loud, but move on. You don't have to go back, turn the mistake into something. So in that way, he told me what not to do, but he encouraged me and supported me to make the mistake something that everyone will appreciate anyway, and no one's gonna know it's a mistake unless you basically say, oh, I'm sorry, I better do that one again, which is basically <laughs> what I said through the saxophone. Yeah. So if that gives you an idea of the kind of person that he was, and he was really supportive, and again, I don't ever remember him telling someone what to do, but he would say, well, leave that out, or don't do that one again. And obviously, the verbiage would be a little different than I'm using now, but you get the gist <laughs> of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Did he have things he would do if he thought you were coasting and not, not giving your 100%? Well, he would always um, let everyone know that if you don't give 110 percent, don't come to the stage. Um, at the point that I met Art was in his late 60s, he always felt, and he probably felt this for a long time, he said, listen, when I play, I play if this could be the last time, because it could. So he never um, played halfway. It was always full bore, and anyone that plays with Art or has watched Art play can, can attest to that. He was a person that always gave every bit of what he had at that moment into the music. And so I think him as an example allowed us all to understand, okay, we can't, we can't coast. So I wouldn't say there was anyone ever coasting. And uh, he would always find a way to um, <clears throat> get the musicians to work with each other and sometimes try to outplay each other which again is the, the testament to a leader, to a great coach, to um, get his players to, in some ways, compete, but really they're creating. <clears throat> and, excuse me, so in that way, Hart really knew how to push buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him in this band about, it must have been 76 or something at the Saratoga Jazz Festival, and I was just astounded at the energy and the enthusiasm, and I, I, I remember, I think every song that they ended when it was over, wham, <laughs> he would, right. he he'd hit something word. again. He's like he couldn't, couldn't resist. He had the last word. Yeah. <laughs> wow, um, and you've had this experience with, fortunately, catching him and Elvin Jones, right at the end of their careers. That that's fortunate, I guess. Yeah, fortunate for me. Yeah. Um, um, also, just the way <clears throat> my life worked out that these gentlemen were at, at the, towards the uh, end of um, their careers and their lives, and so it just signals that there was a kind of changing of the era with the passing of, of these musicians. Um, Elvin was a very, very uh, special person, much in the way of art, very supportive, very loving um, of the diaspora in general, very um, 
I mean, in love with jazz music is what I'm saying. Just in in love with the musicians. I mean, he obviously when he spoke of John Coltrane, it was with reverence. When he spoke of Charlie Parker, when he spoke of Billie Holiday, when he spoke of uh, his friends, in, in addition to his brothers, but he just had a loving um, feeling and and the utmost. Um, responsibility for the music that he was trying to play and so I think that's something that um, Art and Elvin had in common that they really never shortchanged anyone no one can ever say they went to see Elvin Jones or Art Blakey and they got shortchanged it's impossible <laughs> you always got your money's worth that's true I remember seeing him in a club <coughs> once and I thought he was fearsome I mean you say he was a loving person on stage it was like I mean he had to sweat you know, and I see his teeth, and I said, "Man, this this man." Well, that was is that that was the look of his presentation. Yes. And so I'm not saying that he wasn't very very dynamic, dynamic, excuse me, and very very strong. But I mean, in a conversation with Elvin, mm. uh, he was so articulate and so um, specific in his thoughts about the music and his ideas and his um, feelings towards the musicians. And so that's what I mean in terms of a of a very loving uh, appreciation for him to have been able to have played the drums with these different artists. Mm -hmm. But obviously on stage he was a, uh, you know, killer. <laughs> Pardon the phrase, but I mean, he absolutely was. He, it was nothing about him that was, uh, it was loving, but it was still had a certain energy and passion mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, it's a, uh, art was called uh, The Volcano by Dizzy and he was, and Elvin was nicknamed Thunder. Okay. <laughs> so that probably speaks to what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, probably got surrounded there. Right. Um, just to go back to composing for a bit, you, you have a tune that you wrote called Mr. Jones, I sure. believe. And was there a reason that you chose, um, I think it's either 6, 8, or 3, 4 mm -hmm. groove. Is there a reason for that? Well, I loved Elvin's, excuse me, I loved Elvin's playing on three, four. If you listen to them on uh, recordings with John, uh, there's one that they do called Spiritual, which is in C minor. So really that feeling of what we're playing is kind of loosely in my humble um, <coughs> ability to try to uh, come from that mm -hmm. spirit or that energy that John Coltrane played from. Live in the Vanguard is a spirit, is a spirit uh, Spiritual is our spirit as a group from that, so it's a it's a it's out of my my appreciation for Elvin's ability to play okay. in three four. Yeah, and there was one more I wanted to ask you about, um, Mr. Taylor. Mm -hmm. Is that for Cecil Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know Cecil. Okay, it's written for a gentleman that um, I've known for quite some time. He's a very very good friend of mine. He's a uh, just an avid jazz fan in general but he's kind of my groupie he's followed me all over the world and uh, I appreciate being around him he's uh, got a great spirit about him he's a uh, he's a clinical psychologist so he just has so much information and wealth uh, of things to share and so that was written out of my relationship with him oh well that's a nice tribute to somebody to right um, have a I tune. wish uh, yeah uh, that's great to jazz. I have to let him see this someday. I'm sure he'll be happy to, yeah. <laughs> to see that you someone asked about it. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing that caught my ear about that tune uh, that I enjoyed was the uh, unison piano and tenor on the melody. Right. Eric Reed is so special. I think I might have mentioned if he wants to, he could play the melody with me mm -hmm. or maybe in a rehearsal, we did a brief rehearsal, he just said, oh, I want to play the melody with you. Yeah. And so I uh, was really happy to have Eric. I've known him for quite some time, and I have a lot of respect for his um, abilities as a musician. Yeah. And um, very, very honored to have him on the CD. Mm -hmm. It's always good to have something that makes your quartet. How do you orchestrate for a quartet, you know? And just those little things, well, let's play unison here. Right. Again, it may not it, seem like a big it, thing, but it to me, I like it. Absolutely, a lot. it helps um, the arrangement. Mm -hmm. So little subtleties, like you say, that you mentioned or that you noticed, those are things that help to um, um, make it more individual. Mm -hmm. 
the presentation or separate because there's so much material that you have an opportunity to listen to. There's so many recordings nowadays with everyone having the ability basically to make their own music. Yeah. So you have to try to find at some point some way to stand out, not that it's better, but just that it can be somewhat unique or different from all the various um, pieces of music that come out today. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, ask, when you were, let's say, 15 or 16, you were playing the saxophone, you had a supportive family environment as far as music. Did you have aspirations at that age to be a professional musician? Right, absolutely. By that time, in my mind, I was already going to be a jazz messenger. Really? Um, yeah, my father and mother had a vast music collection. So I heard everything from the OJs to Temptations to Sly and the Family Stone to Miles Davis, Carlos Santana, John Coltrane, uh, Ahmed Jamal, Les McCannity Harris. So all that music that, which kind of shocked me because when I got to college, a lot of the music that was just in my house, a lot of musicians hadn't heard of it. So it was, I was fortunate. But my father, big jazz saxophonist, lover and it's particularly Gene Ammons. So I was about 13 and into the music, and again, a lot of this started with him. I'd, for example, be upstairs practicing, and he'd come upstairs and say, hey, you think you can play this? And he'd give me something, and it'd be Gene Ammons. So he was a guy that kind of initiated me trying to learn solos or get lines from solos and things like that. It was him. My father, anyway, Sonny Stitt comes to town two or three years later, and he takes me to see Sonny Stitt. And I got to meet him, and I got to watch him. And when I left the club, there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to be a jazz saxophonist. I was going to be a professional saxophonist that travels all over the world and makes records as early as 14. I really believe, yeah, that was, that was my fond, strong belief of what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. So after that, it was just a matter of starting to take private lessons and uh, meeting musicians who could get me closer to Art Blakey. My father had uh, one of his recordings where he talks on the back, the Clifford Brown recording, and he talks on the back about having young musicians and when these get too old, I'll get some more. And then three or four years later, um, out burst this young man named Wynton Marcellus playing with, with Art. And then obviously, um, it really uh, strengthened my desire to be uh, a jazz messenger. The decision to go to Berkeley, mm -hmm. I don't know if at the time you had would have thought this. What was the goal? The goal was to be with Art Blakey. I was told to go to Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> I was in McDonald's All-American Band, uh, high school All-American Band, which takes two students. I don't know if it exists anymore. They take two mm -hmm. students from each state in the United States. I represented Colorado, me and another person, and Delphia Marcellus represented uh, Louisiana. Well, when I met him, the first thing I said, I want to meet your brother. <laughs> we were in New York um, doing the Macy's, uh, um, Macy's Day Parade. And so I met Bradford. And the first thing I go to him, I said, man, I want to play with Art Blakey. I want to play with you. I want to relax, relax, relax. So he uh, said, well, listen, next time I come to, to Denver, um, I'll give you a call. And I gave him my phone number. And let's say it was 10 months later, he comes to Denver with uh, Wynton Marcellus, and I'm sitting on my bed waiting for the phone to ring, and about 11 or 12 o'clock, the phone rings, and it's Brantford. And I have so much respect for him because I know how it is now, and when people ask things of you at your time, you're moving so quickly, and it's so hard when you get in and out of hotels and things, for him to follow through. And Brantford is not that much older than me, so if I was 18 or 19, he's 23, 24, for him to make that phone call back to me, and he, I, he came over to the house, he listened, we hung out, and I said, I want to play with Art Blakey. He says, well, okay, you got to get your fingers together. I want you to go to Berkeley, and you should go to Berkeley and study with Billy Pierce. And Delphio had just um, enrolled, he had just started his uh, freshman year at Berkeley. This is right after the McDonald's period. And I um, was going to a college in Denver, DU, and so I did just what he told me. I transferred, I got, um, things together. My, he told my parents what he felt. Javon's got a little talent here and that kind of thing. And so I went right to Berkeley. 
So it was all part of that plan. And so, um, again, we all know these things. When we want something, we listen to the people we think they can get us there. So I went right to Berkeley, and I was there for a couple of years, and in and, and, and meeting, uh, in my uh, goal to meet Billy, I met Donald Brown, who's a magnificent pianist, but he was teaching there, and he was a current member of the Messengers. And I became very closely um, in his company. I followed him out everywhere. I would go s see him places, play. I would go sit in with him. I'd watch him and talk to him about the music. And so I initially got my opportunity to sit in was through Donald Brown. So I'm a firm believer in goals. I just believe when you put it out there and you speak it into, um, speak it out or put it out there to the world that it'll, you speak your existence or you speak it into existence. And so it just all pretty much happened very quickly though in, in that kind of uh, motion. Really interesting. And it makes me think about um, Earlier you had said that, uh, referring to Art Blakey and Elvin Jones, <clears throat> when they passed that there was sort of a signal to shift in, in jazz some. But you found a mentor and hung with that guy and it led to what you were hoping for. I mean the mentorship thing is not what it used to be. Least in, least in talking to the you know fellows from the 30s and the 40s, it seems like. Well, you know, um, every era says that the next era isn't like their era. Yes, true. So um, I'm starting to look at things in a way that when I talk to my son, I seem old. You see what I mean? So yeah. each generation says, I don't know how you guys are going to make it. It wasn't yeah. like that in my day. Yeah. And they find a way to make it. So I think a lot of times, no disrespect to any generation, but I think we, we fabricate things in a way to make it seem like it was so much better when we grew up. Well, it was just that way when we grew up. Doesn't make it better, it was the way it was. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate to have opportunities to mentor with Art, to mentor with Elvin, but I still say there's a lot of great musicians from the next era that are still available. Two others. Ron Carter's still here. Um, you know, Wynton Marcellus has taken on that um, uh, uh, level of availability to mentor. Or he's not the same age, but uh, you got Wayne Shorter still here. You got all these magnificent artists that are still available. Now, in some ways, you have to work a little harder to find them, but no one is untouchable. I mean, I think if you really want to get to uh, I believe if I really wanted to get to President Obama, I could get a letter to him. Mm -hmm. I could. I mean, I just don't think anything's that out of reach. I don't. I don't believe it. Um, you know, uh, the fact that we're talking about him as a president. There we, you go. We could all have agreed 20 years ago that would never have happened. Yeah. So there's always something available. So the mentorship is different, but I think it's still available. Um, when musicians say, for example, well, we don't have the clubs like they were 40 years ago. No, but look at all the various opportunities that are in the um, various schools and curriculums. So it seems like the clubs, there's been a shift. I'm not going to say it's better or worse, it's different. Mm -hmm. And so each individual has to make it work for him or her, as opposed to saying, well, I wish it was better this way. Well, that, that doesn't make any, make any sense to say that. You just have to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. That's the way I believe. It's just the way it is. Sure, it would be great to have had uh, uh, 10 to 15 clubs in New York like there were 30, 40 years ago. Well, there's not. There's only five or six really major clubs. So get in the mix and be part of those. Mm -hmm. Or whatever it takes to create um, a sense where you can be viable um, as the concert I'm doing tomorrow night is part of a series of events that I'm doing partnered with uh, Mid-Atlantic Mid -Atlantic Arts and right. they're providing something to make this thing happen so there's, there's a lot of things happening in some ways many more opportunities now available to um, uh, create oneself um, like you say uh, I still came from an era where the, just the tip in of working with somebody, getting an apprenticeship, sure, I happen to think that is a better way 
than maybe some of the situations that are coming up now. I feel like a lot of musicians aren't getting the first-hand experience that I got. So when I went to Art Blakey and said, well, could I talk to you about Thelonious Monk? It wasn't second-hand information. <laughs> right. So in that way, yes, but there's still some musicians that are here today that can tell you about Thelonious Monk, or that can tell you about Art Blakey, or that can tell you about Charlie Parker. So there's becoming less and less of them, but even still, there's gonna be a conduit from that person to the next person to the next person, and so that's the way you have to work it. I mean, everyone yeah. doesn't know Frank Sinatra, but there's someone who knew him or knew. I met a woman the other night. I was in Monterey at the jazz festival. I met Louis Jordan's widow. And it, I met her through another person, but I said, wow. And so I'm quizzing her and I'm talking to her and I'm saying, wow, because this person was Sonny Rollins' first influence, was Louis Jordan, told to me by Sonny. So it just shows you that all this information is, is still available to us, and we have the music. So, I mean, sure, there's pros and cons. Yeah. Every way, there's organic, and there's, you know, this and that, but everyone has to work it out for themselves um, to what degree that they want to go out and try to seek it, because I still believe these opportunities are very much here. Have you ever had to work a, well, let's say from the time you went to Berkeley, have you ever had to work a non-music job? No. <laughs> no, I never have. I tell you, the only thing I would do on the summers, I would work for, um, in Denver, it was Frontier Airlines. And uh, I worked this job because I wanted to buy a saxophone. So I loaded planes, loaded luggage, and unloaded luggage for, I think, two summers. And then I was able to buy maybe the saxophone I have now, maybe the saxophone prior to it. So yeah, in that respect, other than you know, working a little bit in the Tower Records in Boston and Berkeley to have right. some extra cash, I've never, I've been fortunate that mm -hmm. uh, the career has been uh, good to me, that there's never had to be any other type of job than just playing the saxophone yeah. or in this business we know as music. Right. Mm -hmm. If you look at your, uh, you're doing your income taxes at the end of the year or whatever, can you get a sense of how your income as a total, how is it broken up between live gigs, some teaching, recording, whatever? For me, I would say heavy on the performance. Um, but there's a lot of school things that are involved in there. Mm -hmm. um, perf recordings, sure, that's in there too. But um, I'd say performing would be strong, but we do a lot of, or I do a lot of, I say we is speaking for the band, we do a lot of uh, performing arts centers or like the situation tomorrow. So that would be, I don't know, 70, 30, mm -hmm. because there's always using the educational component like we're doing now with you. So there's that aspect is there. That's a good question. I would say, again, there's a lot of involvement with, uh, with colleges and things like that, so, or educational situations. So I would say, yeah, thinking about it, it's probably, I was going to say 70, 30, but it might be 65, 35, uh -huh. yeah, because it always seems to be some kind of component. But in the summer, then a lot of them are just uh, festivals because there's no school in session. So. Right. so I would say, and we do a lot of work in the summer, touring to Japan or touring to Europe or touring in the States, which wouldn't have any kind of educational components. So maybe 70-30. The record ch business, LPs, CDs, et cetera, has changed an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, you have a decent relationship with a label now well, I do. Um, I'm with Palmetto. Enjoy them very much. They work very, very hard. Um, it, it does seem that it, um, a lot of uh, musicians have gone the route of recording for themselves and, and investing in their career in that way, and uh, all for it. I think it's um, for those, again, each situation is different for each individual, and also it's availability to the the funds to make that uh, happen because once you, you make the recording, well then 
you would hopefully like someone to get it to the radio station, and then you got to pay for someone to distribute it, then you got to pay for it to be made, and then you know, those kinds of things. And uh, so the fees outside just the recording still can be moderate because I know a bunch of musicians that do it and are very successful with it. So it's one way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Are there issues in the, the business of music as far as getting gigs and so forth that are non-musical, generational, uh, racial, uh, man, woman, anything like that? Does that come into play as far as you, you know? Well, I look at it like this. You get on the phone, uh, you make a phone call to a club, you mention to the club owner, I'd like to work your venue. And either they're available there or not. Now, available to you or they're not. Now, I know a lot of people, musicians that I know will tell you, well, you can't do it on your own and you can't uh, call clubs because they don't want to talk to musicians. And, and I found that to be the absolute non-truth. Um, the festivals that we just played, I booked them. Um, I have a writer, I have a contract, I do all that kind of stuff. I found that I was not, at the time, viable enough to make management relevant for me. Uh -huh. So I felt that I could do better by selling myself, myself. And um, after you get over the initial shock of making the first phone call, um, which to this day, I have never received a no. I have never called a club owner or head of a festival and received a no. Because I don't look at it as a no. All it means is for this year, there's no room. Then you call back the next year, there may be no room. And then the next year, you get the gig. So I never look at it as no. It just means not right now, mm -hmm. which is that's what it means. And so you never take it. The tough thing is to sell yourself and to have someone tell you no and not take it personally mm -hmm. because it's not personal. The bottom line is, are you viable enough to help this presenter, uh, i.e. club owner, make the amount of money that you're asking for so that it's a win-win for him and you? So if it's not, then you have to bring him a product that will help him help you. That's the way I look at it. So it's the same as anybody in any other profession. And I think what happens with the musician, it's tough because we have this artistic um, property where we practice all day and now I've got to get and sell myself and, and I've been practicing and I've got this and I've got this to offer and, and, and who is this guy to tell me he doesn't like me and I, my value is this and that. That's when you make it personal. But the business aspect of it is, guess what? Um, this is what it is. Case in point, you called my house. You said, Javon, I'd like to have you come and speak to me about um, uh, your life and your career. And we spoke about the price. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, man, I don't know if I want to do that. I hung up the phone. And when I hung up the phone, I thought about it. I said, you know what? If I don't sit down and give a reflection of my career or sit down and articulate myself to someone, how's anyone going to know about me? So if I really want success, I just walk the other way from success. So I called you back and I said, you know what? I want the opportunity. Because if it was good enough for Joe Williams, it's good enough for Javon Jackson. But the musician is always weighing these situations where we feel we're not being respected or we're not getting what we deserve. And guess what? Nobody gets what they deserve. <laughs> That's why we negotiate. <laughs> well, so <I'm> people don't <laughs> understand that. Negotiation <laughs> means you don't get what you want. <laughs> if you got what you want, well, you get, there'd be no negotiation. And but so you the jazz get, musician it, really, I'm sorry, go ahead. You can get something, you know, and hopefully yeah. it's good for you. My mother yeah. always taught me, God rest his soul, if you get a bowl of lemonades, what do you do? A bowl of lemons, what do you do? You yeah. make lemonade. So there's always a positive out of a negative. But again, you have to really work at it. And you really have to be... Um, uh, willing to take that chance. In other words, um, Branford doesn't negotiate for himself. He has management. 
But I cannot say, well, because Branford is doing it that way, it has to work that way for me. It doesn't work that way for me. But guess what? You can still be happy. I'm making a lot of great relationships and, and, and nurturing relationships and building relationships that will last me 20, 30 years. So I don't have to feel upset. And if someone says um, they're not interested, it's not personal. All it lets me know is, okay, guess what? I need to retool, uh, rethink my plan, and come back to the drawing board with something that can be accessible. Now, some people say, oh, well, I don't want to do that. Well, that's okay. But it is still down to what are you offering? So if you make 10 phone calls and nobody gives you a gig, that means maybe you've got to, re you've got to rethink your presentation. Um, if, but again, you have some people that just want to practice, play their art, and don't want to go through this aspect of getting on the phone and having to go through a lot of the negotiation and conversation that have nothing to do with music. Um, at one point, I felt like that too, but you know, I have a family pro to provide for. I have a mortgage. <laughs> so that starts to become part of the conversation. Sure, I want to be able to treat the music the same way I did when I'm 13, but guess what? When I was 13, I didn't have any responsibilities. So I try to keep that, um, uh, uh, that naivete on stage. But the bottom line is it is a business and that mm -hmm. it's a medium of exchange. You're giving something to receive something. And so you have to be able to, to, to involve yourself in the other aspects. And whether you're doing it yourself or someone's doing it for you, you're still entering into what we call business. Have you had uh, potential managers or club owners who, who would say to you, well, if you only did more, um, you know, organ trio type stuff, or if you had a little more, uh, put some reggae into your act, or tried to insert musical decisions for you? I've never had a club owner tell me a musical prowess such as that, but I've had club owners asking, is there a way that we could beef up the lineup? Now, the first gig I ever had in my life in New York as a leader was at the Village Vanguard. I went up to the owner, Lorraine Gordon, and said, I'd like to work the Vanguard. And she said, well, listen, who's going to be in your band? Okay? I said, well, let me make some phone calls. Well, I knew Ron Carter not as well as I know him now, but I knew him to a point that I felt comfortable with asking him if he'd support me. I called Kenny Barron, and I called Lewis Nash. She didn't tell me that, but intuitively I felt if I got these names, she'll give me a week. I went back, I said, I've got Kenny Barron, Ron Carter, Lewis Nash. She gave me a week. Wow. That was a lot of pressure, and I learned a lot, though. But the point of it is, is if you know you're going to play Carnegie Hall, you got to try to fill Carnegie Hall up, right? So uh, you have to have a, and I, I do have this, um, I don't know what you'd say, uh, uh, high-end nature. <laughs> so okay. my first record, I called Elvin. <laughs> he did it. So I have always felt that, um, not that there's a level, but I've always, I've never been, too nervous to call anybody. So the fact that I have to call these clubs and try to get a performance opportunity for myself, it, it's not that big of a deal. I've mm -hmm. never had a problem with that. I think that's really interesting in that sometimes when you see a new artist and you see the cast of supporting characters and they're like, wow, I always thought that that probably came from the record company. Look, you need to have this to help sell your first. More times record. than not, it does. Okay. More times than not, it does. But for me, again, no disrespect to Ron, no disrespect to Les McCann, no disrespect to Kenny Band or Freddie Hubbard, but I started with Art Blakey. Okay. If I'm sitting with Art Blakey and he's talking about Charlie Parker and Sarah Vaughn, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, those were his friends, Bud Powell. So that gave me the confidence because that was American Express card. Mm -hmm. When I told people I was with Art Blakey, you're right in. Mm -hmm. Or, um, so 
I did have a little bit more of a caveat, but I think that gave me confidence because R. Blakey said, no one can stop you but you. Hmm. And he would always say things like, don't be a chicken and scratch for it, be a man and ask for it. So if you want something, you got to reach out for it. And even if Mr. Carter said no, it wouldn't be personal. Mm -hmm. I, again, um, one of the greatest books I've ever read in my life is called um, The Four Agreements. And it's four agreements, and it, the, the agreements are um, always do your best, don't take things personal, um, be impeccable with your word, and don't assume. And I found that um, not taking anything personal, although it seems like it's a hard concept, nothing is personal. If you got up right now and said, I hate this article, I mean, I hate the way this interview is going, and I hate the way this is um, working out, we're done, you're out of here. That's not my issue. That's something that you felt, mm -hmm. that I can't go inside of your mind to figure out. So it's not personal. It was your choice. So it's a hard concept, and it's taken me years to really wrap myself around things. Everyone makes choices that, um, at the end of the day, are their own personal choices that have nothing to do with anybody else. That's just what I believe. And so um, we all make a, a choice about whether we want success, we make a choice about this, and with this and that, and that choice we make propels us to do the work that we're gonna do. So if I wanna start um, playing in the New York Symphony tomorrow, obviously it's gonna be a lot of arduous work, but also I've gotta meet the people in that area and I might have to play in the Syracuse Symphony on my way to the New York Symphony. Or I may never get to the Syracuse from New York Symphony. But the point of it is, we're trying to work towards that point. And you set, just, you set a goal for yourself. Yeah. And I just feel at the end of the day, we're, we're all getting what we asked for. Well, I have a feeling your students, uh, <clears throat> you do some work at Purchase? I don't do any teaching. I taught at Purchase oh, okay. for four or five years. And right. you know what? I'm very close to Ron Carter, and he said, you travel a lot. And I said, yeah. He said, well, if you can't be there consistently, stop teaching. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. I think he is, too. I've often wondered how the, the musicians who are playing as much as you are manage to do that with any consistency. It's a tender balance because the students come because you're international. Yeah. But then, then you should have to become local to accommodate the students that are coming there because you're international. <laughs> and for me, I felt badly after Ron made me look at that certain way where I was traveling all the time, and when I would come back, I'm trying to catch a guy up in one week, three weeks worth of stuff. And he wasn't getting that, um, that consistently st steady development that he deserved. Yeah. And uh, for me, it was just hard to juggle. You got a family, and trying to travel and then when you're home you're away from home with school so I just had to make a decision and then also I didn't for me I didn't feel like I could consistently develop uh, I just felt my energy was split I mean if I was at the school two days a week or I mean, sometimes almost three days a week and I was there um, eight hours or so when I got home, I, it was hard for me to get that energy up to put time in for Javon and the saxophone and the music they needed to do. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of just made a choice. Yeah. Is it hard um, maintaining a family life with the travel you do? I, I would say normally it is hard, but in my situation, again, I'm unique because my wife has known me since I was 12 years old. We grew up together. We were the same age. So she's always seen me with a saxophone. Uh. So it's not anything, now she had to get used to living with a saxophonist and, and, and the quirkiness of a jazz musician, but she never had any, um, she's always seen me with a saxophone. So that's something that everyone that knows me, that knows us, so, oh yeah, well Javon's been playing the saxophone forever, so it's, you still play, yeah, you still play the saxophone, it's just, so that's pretty constant. But then I have someone who is my partner who has been willing to sacrifice because in a relationship, when someone's doing really well or successful, at some point someone has to sacrifice for the sake of the family. Mm -hmm. And obviously when I get home from touring or whatever, I make what sacrifices I can to be there to help play catch up to support that family. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, 
that's a very important um, component to my maturity is family life mm-hmm. and development as an artist absolutely is having a, a family having me grounded it, it creates and promotes humility because when you come home from that long tour in Japan they want you to go down the street and get uh, some more milk <laughs> <laughs> So you need those kinds of things that are very grounding, or uh, who's going to wash the clothes this week? Yeah. Who's going to sweep the floor? I mean, right. general things. Sometimes we have someone do it. Sometimes we do it. So um, I, I, I appreciate those things that keep me humble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's it? Uh, is it a challenge to keep a working trio behind you, a consistent group of, of musicians? It can be uh, to a point, but I, what I feel if you um, share with these musicians what you're trying to do, and also if you give enough lead time. If you're booking in March, and we're now we're in September, there's enough lead time to get to a point the musicians that you want. Sometimes you can't, but again, that's what I learned from Mark Blakey. No one monkey stops the show. So you should be able to, see now all these things about art are coming back to me now. You should be able to get someone else and plug them in and you should still be able to present what you, you, you pr- present what it is that you would like to present. You shouldn't feel like, oh man, I don't have my man on drums, I'm not gonna be able to play what I wanna play. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. You should still be able to present what you wanna present. Obviously, if you can get a strong nucleus of guys and you can work, but the point of it is too is, do you have enough work to be able to keep these guys committed to you. I mean, you almost have to be there on the road all the time, which is very difficult. <clears throat> and I know some musicians who stay on the road all the time, and when you're on the road all the time, you can get that commitment because there's a volume, and you're able to pay musicians a consistent salary. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have the consistent salary, and all of a sudden something pops up, well, they've already committed to something else. They've got to work, and I don't know that I've been that kind of artist that's um, I'm getting to the point now, I'm usually doing things a couple, two times a month at least. But what about those other two weeks? <laughs> when they've got to feed themselves and the other um, business things that go along with that. So you have to respect anybody that's getting work. And hopefully you can, uh, again, to, to, to start booking yourself far enough in advance where musicians, the ones that you want to be available for you. Occasionally, um, I'll have a student um, ask me what I'm thinking about when I improvise, and I usually have a it's sort of a hard time actually answering the question. Why? Because I think um, I'm I'm fairly much chord oriented. I'm thinking about what chord I'm playing at the same time I'm thinking about trying to create a nice melody over the top of it. But if they're not that familiar with chord structure yet, I'm not sure what to say to them. Well, you're right. You have to have some understanding of uh, harmonically what's going on. But I will say you try to learn all of these various techniques and, and, and your phrases that you're learning and themes, and then hopefully you can go on stage with a clean slate. Mm-hmm. And then you can just create based on what's uh, provided to you by your um, musical environment at that particular time. So the pianist, the pianist is feeding you something, the bass player is feeding you something, the drummer is feeding you something, and I'm hopefully having a conversation with these individuals as well. In, in, and I obviously we all think the way we think. So um, in that way, you start to build your themes uh, based on. Uh, those ideas that are being are coming to you from that which you already know and that which you're hopefully being willing to accept or um, uh, be a part of that's going on around you but obviously it starts with vocabulary so it's like a person wanting to speak English well you can't speak English unless you know the ABC's mm-hmm. unless you know how sentences are put together so that's to be a certain amount of study before you can involve yourself so I would say to a person, just start learning the language. Once you start learning the language, then you'll be able to converse. But you can't converse until you know the words. And every music 
or every uh, language has certain things that go with the music. If I wanted to wake up tomorrow and be a rapper, there's certain things that go with uh, that diaspora that I have to study so that, I'll, so that I'll feel or be welcomed in as part of the clique. I hear people say, well, I don't want to learn any of the things in the past because it's going gonna, it's gonna to hinder me. I don't see how. It doesn't hinder a doctor when he studies the history of music. I mean, the history of uh, medicine mm -hmm. to be a doctor. Nobody wants to go to a doctor that's never studied any medicine. And if you go to a doctor and say, well, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm really not going to use the history of medicine. Nobody would go to that doctor. But all of a sudden, when it comes to music, oh, man, I, I, I'm going to do my own thing. Well, you're going to do your own thing, but it's always going to come based on something. Mm -hmm. It's got to be unless you're just a hermit in the woods. And then all of a sudden, you're going to behave like the animals. You're going to, everybody has to cling I feel to something to have um, to have a foundation. You got to come from something. I mean, we're all born and we all learn from somebody how we do what we do. Nobody just took a baby and just left him there. He wouldn't make it. You got to have a, some kind of development. So you have to, at some point, recognize the techniques and use some part of the technique. Mm -hmm. Whether you want to come from the technique of Charlie Parker, you want to use the technique of uh, Lester Young, or you want to use the technique of um, the techniques used by Ornette Coleman or John Coltrane or Sun Ra or somebody, but this got to pull from somewhere. Probably <clears throat> someone has asked you in the past about your grounding, you know, of those artists. Who who do you feel you sort of came out of? Well, I like to say I steal from everybody. I mean, but uh, the original, obviously, was Charlie Parker, mm -hmm. um, because someone said that's where you start. My father was giving me Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt records, so I was listening to that. Then came Charlie Parker. Then someone said, well, you need to listen to Dexter Gordon. Then I went to see him. Then somebody said, okay, well, now you got to check out a guy named Sonny Rollins. Okay, well, you got Sonny Rollins. Okay, what about Lucky Thompson? Okay, well, what about Coleman Hawkins? Then all, you're all over the place. Then you got, after a while, there's Joe Henderson comes along for me, which is a big for me. Then all of a sudden, I find a guy named Eddie Harris. I started to listen to him. Well, then all of a sudden, you say, let's move up to the trumpet. And then you hear a guy named Freddie Hubbard. Mm -hmm. Then you listen to the trombone. You got J.J. Johnson. Well, let's go to bass. You got Paul Chambers. And I've learned things from all those musicians. I didn't even mention Miles, how much I've learned from him. So there's so much that's available to us. You just listen. And if you enjoy it, you try to figure it out a little bit and see what you can use from it. And at the same point, uh, as you become an older person, you will find your own way of delivering it. Some people can do it quicker than others. Some people are able to get to it at 19 or 20. But sometimes you have to, you have to live a long time or live a while before you can play something that, you know what, I'm gonna play this. This is what I wanna play. Mm -hmm. And you feel comfortable with doing that and you feel good about it. As opposed to, man, I did that, but Coltrane would have done that. See, when you get to a certain age and confidence level, you're okay with the fact that Coltrane did this way and I'm gonna do it my way because we're both, at the end of the day, doing the same thing. We're trying to just enjoy ourselves. But it takes a period um, for some development. It took me a period longer probably than others where I really felt like, um, you know, I'm, uh, this is the way Javon feels about it and I didn't feel like I had to be just like Joe Henderson where there was a period where I really was um, I don't want to say obsessed because I didn't stalk him, but I really was listening to all his recordings. And then after a while, it started to be to a point where everybody would say, oh, I mean, he sounds like Joe Henderson. Well, it got to a point where it just wasn't flattering anymore. It used to be flattering, but it got to a point. It, oh. didn't, it didn't hurt my feelings, but at a certain point, it was like, wow, there's other things in there than just Joe Henderson. Hmm. But for whatever reason, people heard that. And you still, again, you just keep building and try to go through the wall. And after a while, let some other influences come into my life. And the fact of, it was, the, fact of the matter was, there was a lot of Joe Henderson um, paid attention to by me. And so once I started letting some other things seep through, some other styles, some other ideas, then it started to uh, dilute itself a little bit. It's still there, but it's diluting itself. Mm -hmm. Are there any artists, I'm not sure how to phrase this, um, that got to a point where their music that and that you didn't like it anymore. I'll I'll use an example. When I was when I was younger, um, I didn't know who John Coltrane was yet, 
whenever I was in junior high, and someone said, well, you better listen to John Coltrane, and I went and bought Ohm. And my first exposure to John Coltrane was, wow, I could not handle that. Has there been an artist that you admired that kept progressing to the point where he's lost me? No. No. I uh, just appreciate the fact that that person or artist is still trying to push the envelope and is still trying to find something um, different or a, a another facet of their creative nature. So right, the Coltrane in 57 is very different than 66, but it's still Coltrane. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the ride. I really do. Okay. So I don't know. I hear a lot of people going, well, man, Wayne sure doesn't sound like he does. He doesn't sound like he did in 1961. He's not supposed to. That's like me saying, well, man, some of your high school friends, man, you don't look like you did when you were 17. <laughs> well, you're not supposed to. We would like to. Maybe or maybe not. Maybe. But that's the way this yeah. thing is. It's different. And so these trees, they look different every year. The dogs, as they age, they look different. That's what this thing is. We're trying to evolve. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we have trouble because we're not trying to evolve. We want to stay in that place as a listener, maybe. But that creative person is trying to to move on. But I think if you listen real hard, you can still find some of the things, some of that uh, quality that you liked in the other person. It's still there. Mm -hmm. You might have to search a little harder. Or you might have to work a little harder. But it's probably still there. But it, it, again, it's an evolution. So I, I, can't, I can't think of any artists that I liked and all of a sudden just didn't like. Uh -huh. Now, there could be artists that maybe over time they've grown on me, which is the other way. Ah. Maybe someone that at one point I didn't necessarily understand, and now I appreciate. I probably, uh, somebody like um, Led Zeppelin, for example, I appreciate them now more. Because I don't listen to it from a perspective of, I'm not looking for them to swing. I'm trying to appreciate it from their perspective. See, when I was younger, I was a jazz snob, where everything to me had to funnel itself at some point from one, two, one, two, <laughs> three, four. So now I'm understanding that, okay, uh, Santana loves what we do, but it doesn't necessarily funnel itself from the hi-hat on two and four and the bass drum on four beats. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to appreciate yeah. that for what it is. I can't go into an Italian restaurant and say, man, this doesn't taste like soul food. It's not supposed to. <laughs> and so I think as I've gotten older, uh, I've been able to, and I'm still a young man, but I'm still able, to, I'm, I'm getting to a point where everybody has all these things to offer. There was a period there when I said, you know what, I want to start playing some of the music that influenced me. So you hear me doing Wake Up Everybody, No More Sleep. So I'm doing that kind of music where before, when I just left art and I joined Blue Note Records, I probably wouldn't have recorded any of that. Or maybe now I'm doing a Marvin Gaye tune or a Stevie Wonder song. I, as far as I'm concerned, that's open game for me. Now I've got good friends who would say, no way. And guess what? That's why these different people are able to come and exist. And that's why we have all this wonderful um, music out here because no one thinks the same. Everyone's got a different way of approaching it and everybody's got a different wrinkle to put in it. And I, I've got good friends who do have no uh, inclination or would never record a Stevie Wonder song. And I respect them for that. But for me, I feel that I can grow by doing some different things. It helps me become better. Now they might say, well, if you stay down this way, you'll become better. But for me, um, my nature is to search and to look for some different things, as they probably say they are too. So again, it's, it's respecting everyone and what they try to do, because we're all, at the end of the day, we're all trying to be better. It takes every kind of people, right? It takes every kind of person, and I really believe everyone is doing the best they can. <laughs> and once they try to do better, they will. But a person uh, that's the worst person in the world, Believe it or not, that's just the best he can do. 
So hopefully you'll be inspired to do better. Mm -hmm. So I think at that, at that level, it's very basic. Are you a, um, a player who, I guess I'm going back to this thinking and improvisation. Do you think scales and modes and that kind of thing while you're playing? I'd say it's a combination maybe. Uh, obviously you think shapes. Mm -hmm. Well the shape is a sound. So the sound could have um, a certain harmonic element to it. Obviously but if you're phrasing and you're shaping then the harmony is going to come in. So we all at some point begin to play some structure or some sense of the harmony when we start talking about real creative uh, music and not necessarily jam band type music or something like that or, or pop music where there's a rhythm that's um, articulated and, and uh, re-articulated and it's focused. But when you start to um, start to build, yeah, I would think that at some point there's going to be, I'm going to think of a shape and the shape might take the form of a major triad or it might take the shape of a dominant seven or you, you start to build these themes and these themes have some kind of um, uh, they've got to have some kind of harmonic uh, connection and if you hear a person do it over and over then you know because they've developed something that's when you know that they've developed it because they can get to it more than one time it's not random if you hear Coltrane do a succession of records that go to certain themes it lets you know he's figured out a certain type of a system mm -hmm. which is what we all do when we get up in the morning, we learn a system. We have a system, if we're successful, that works best. Um, we don't get up, make the bed, go downstairs, eat, and then go back and brush our teeth, and then we go back downstairs, and we go up and get dressed. No, it's a system. And the ones that have that system, those are the ones that seem to excel. And uh, so there's a, definitely a system with the improvisation, but I do feel you have the themes, you have the shapes, and then you have um, this willingness to create, whether it's beauty, whether it's uh, uh, maybe more forceful delivery. All of these things play a part in, in the presentation of a solo. What constitutes a wrong note for you? There is no wrong note, hmm. as R. Blakey taught me. Way back when I told you, R. Blakey told me, if you make a mistake, make it loud. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there is no mistake. Yeah. We've trained ourselves that if we have a C7 and you play a C sharp, that's a wrong note. It's not a wrong note. It's where it's going. Where is the C sharp going? Where are you leading it to? So if you have a C7 and you play a C sharp, it means it's a, a diminished chord. But if you let it sit there, I mean... <laughs> So it doesn't make a mistake if you want to sit it there. If you want it okay. to sit there, that's your choice. You're, cho you're choosing to play that note and have it do whatever. If you have a G, and you have a G on top, that's an octave. Mm -hmm. That's the sun and the other being, if you want to look at it like that. If you have a G and you have a D, that's the son and dad. Or if you have a G and a D, you have uh, the son and his brothers and sisters. If you have a G and an A, that's the ninth, those are your cousins. If you have a G and a G sharp, it's your next door neighbor. So you're never that far away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well said. That's the way I look at it. This has been really terrific. You know, and um, I'm thinking you're going to meet some students later on, and I know that there are students here who want to be where you are. Sure. And um, I'm wondering if you have, you, you're obviously very goal-oriented. What's your goal for the next number of years, and do you have other places that you want to get to? Sure. I have a goal where I want to be... Um, uh, much more, um, believe it or not, on tour with me and my own groups. Mm -hmm. um, I have goals where I'd like to uh, write for a major motion picture or write for some type of film to continue this. Um, goals to be a much better saxophonist. 
Um, so um, you have goals to earnings for your band. I want to be able to pay my musicians a certain amount of money. I want them to be able to earn a certain amount of money in a year with me. Mm. So then I'll have the musicians consistently like I want them if I'm able to pay them or keep them on a, enough of a basis where this money is coming along. But I, I do feel that you make that goal and you say, well, you know what? I'm going to learn a song a week for six months. So that's something basic. So the first week, you, um, there'll never be another you. Then the next week, I remember April. Then the next week, around midnight. Then the next week, okay. And then once you memorize those songs in six months, how many songs would you know? Mm -hmm. Or if you made a simple goal, I want to practice every day for one hour for six months, no matter what. Where will we be if we practiced every day for at least one hour, no matter what, for six months? Mm -hmm. You're going to be a lot stronger than you are today. Mm -hmm. And within that, then you make little goals. Well, what am I going to practice? You know, uh, Bradford told me when Marcellus, his brother, would get up in the morning and put his metronome at 60. So da da di da 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 di. Do de de do do de do do do. That's from Herbert Clark, Trumpet Studies. Practiced like that for six months. He said one day he just woke up. You know what I mean? So, got to work towards. You got to crawl. You got to walk, and you can run. So you got to make the baby steps. It's just like anything that you're doing um, in terms of as an educator, as a teacher. It started with a certain um, theme or thought process. Now you have a, um, a skill set that you work from in respect to these interviews, how you go about it, um, the nature of it, the questions. It's all a skill set. And so what the student has to realize is that it's a skill set. And you have to figure, okay, what do I want to practice? And these are the things that I learned a little later, maybe I can share with them, just so you don't waste a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You can figure out what you want to practice, how you want to practice, um, the amount of time. Sometimes I'm learning now, when your mind tells you I should stop, you keep going, that's when you should stop. Just stop. If you've been practicing for three hours and your mind tells you to stop, you keep practicing, are you really still progressing or have you hit the wall? You've probably hit the wall. Mm -hmm. So little things like that, but there's so many little subtle things that we can do. Um, you know, again, I read all these kind of what my, most people call corny books, you know, like uh, uh, one book I read one time says, every time the phone rings, smile before you answer it. I tried a couple times. I said, wow, the, the, the conversation always seems to be pleasant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well, this has been a pleasant conversation. Okay. I enjoyed it a lot. My pleasure. you have any last to Blakeyisms you want to share uh, with us? Well, I, I tell you what. I, I feel that um, in Art's honor, I'm going to try to help as many people as I can because I know that's what he was doing. He wanted to help musicians, and I know that one thing he always told me is don't put another musician down because if you put another musician down, you're putting yourself down. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to, obviously in my recesses, we, you know, we uh, make more uh, judgments about people than we probably should, but I always feel that I should start off with something positive to say about any artist, any musician, find something positive because there really, there really is something there that's positive. We just choose to look at the negative aspect, but everyone doing something has some redeeming quality <laughs> that we can find. And so I've been, uh, just want to be, uh, it's helpful to other musicians as Art Blakey was to me, as Elvin was to me, as Freddie Hubbard was to me, um, Eddie Harris, uh, Stanley Turrentine, all these guys were very available, as Sonny Rollins is available to me, or Ron Carter, all these musicians. It's one big happy community, so um, I have to be willing to support other people in their endeavors in the way I was supported. And so that would be my R. Blakey. Um, R. Blakey used to wear a t-shirt that said, Experience Teaches. And so I think, yeah, if I can maybe give some advice and, and, and help uh, someone to facilitate their career a little bit quicker than I did, then, um, that's my responsibility. All right. Well said. On that note, I'll okay. get you to your next uh, engagement. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your time. Thank you.